Hey guys, I'm back, ready to talk about more intelligence stuff. Um, like I was doing um, before, I'm just gonna cover one module today. I'll go through module 61, um, and then I'll get through um, the rest of this material before the end of the week, like I said, after we finish chapter 11 and I post AP Classroom questions, we're done until April 6th, um, you get your spring break. Um, and that point it will just be a review. I will have covered everything that will be on the AP exam. Sadly, um, abnormal psych and social psych will not be covered since the order of the curriculum, most people had not gotten to that stuff yet. So none of that will be on the exam. Um, I'm happy to share information, you know, videos, articles, anything you want that pertains to that stuff because it is probably the most interesting stuff in psychology, which they save the best for last. And it's also usually a huge part of the exam. But this year, um, under these circumstances, we are not gonna be covering it. So I apologize for that. But anyways, so back to intelligence. So I gave you some important theories on intelligence and some names to know yesterday. There's a great chart in your textbook that you can use um, to keep those names straight. Um, I'm going to give you a few more names today. The first one we're going to talk about, um, and this today we're kind of focusing more on the origin of where intelligence testing came from. Um, and it all started in France with a guy named Alfred Binet. Alfred Binet was basically told by the government that all children need to attend school and that they needed a way to identify school children that needed assistance. So ultimately he was developing a test to find out if kids were um, performing at their age level. So he identified that by coming up with a way to measure what he calls their mental age. So your mental age is your level of performance associated with a certain chronological age. So for example, if you were performing as an eight-year-old at the level of an average eight-year-old, your mental age would be eight as well as your chronological age. But if you were an eight-year-old performing at the average of a 10-year-old, then while your chronological age was eight, your mental age would be 10. You guys get the point, I think. Um, so his goal was to measure mental age, kind of get gauge when and if children needed assistance um, to make sure they got placed correctly in school. And Binet really kind of focused on the environmental effects of why children might be struggling or be behind and how to help kids who are in need of assistance. Fast forward in the United States, a guy named Lewis Terman takes the test created by Binet and he changes it. He adapts it, he stretches it out on the higher end so that it um, is now includes teenagers and superior adults. And Terman's big thing was intelligence is genetic. And so he thought, let's create a new intelligence test and see who the smart people are and maybe we could even start, you know, breeding those people. He believed in eugenics, so we won't get too much into that. But anyway, so he created what they call the Stanford Binet, which is still used today. You can go online, you can take a you can take a Stanford Binet test online. They have two versions, a short one and a longer one. Um, but basically what you need to know about Terman and the Stanford Binet is that it was the original test created for children in France by Alfred Binet then adapted to include the higher um, age levels, adults and teens, um, adding that superior end to the test. And again, he used this test for a completely different reason. It was more of identifying the superior intelligent people. And like I said, thinking that we could, you know, breed out the unintelligent, if you will. Okay, so moving on. With the um, term and test came the IQ. A guy named William Stern developed the IQ or intelligence quotient. We've all heard the term IQ a million times. The way that the original IQ was measured was by taking your mental age, divide that by your chronological age times 100. That ends up giving you that average IQ of 100. So if you're eight and you perform at the level of an average eight-year-old, you divide, um, and you multiply times 100, you get an IQ of 100. Now, that's all well and good, except what happens when you get to adults. And now all of a sudden, if I'm 40 and I'm performing the same as an average 20 year old, does that mean I have an IQ of 50? 
Well, obviously not. So today the IQ is measured much differently and we'll talk about that in a second. But um, the original IQ quotient, that's what the formula was. That's where it came from, a man named William Stern. Um, you know, like I said, today your IQ, if you have taken an IQ test or choose to, your score is relative to other test takers, which again, I'll talk about here in just a second. One of the um, most common ways that we see measures of mental abilities today are through both achievement and aptitude tests. Um, these are terms you've probably heard before. Achievement tests are going to be those that reflect what you have learned. So um, AP tests are achievement tests. They are tests that are given to measure what you already know and what you have learned. And so um, any test you take in school ultimately is an achievement type test where aptitude tests are intended to predict your ability to perform in the future, whether that's in college or whether that's in a new job with a new skill. Your aptitude test will be things like the ACT, the SAT. So they're looking at, when they look at those scores and why those matter, going to college is they're trying to predict how well you will perform at your freshman year of college. And so the idea is that there is a correlation and if you're looking at the, um, PowerPoint right now, you can see there's the table that shows SAT scores with um, IQ, and it shows a positive correlation you can see in the slope between IQ and SAT scores. So the idea that colleges have when they look at your ACT is that the higher your ACT, the smarter you are, meaning the better you'll perform as a college freshman, okay? Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what they're measuring with aptitude is your ability to learn new skills or to perform in the future. Um, a couple of, or another, sorry, um, the most commonly used intelligence test today is the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale. So this one comes um, with the adult, it's 16 and over. There's also a um, intelligence scale for children. Um, but this is what's most commonly used today. So when we look at that um, normal curve um, on the next slide that shows you the Weschler intelligence scores and that average of 100, this is where that comes from. Same thing with the Stanford Binet if you um, chose to take that one. The way that they get that average score of 100 today is by taking a pre-tested group um, a representative sample of people, testing them, and then that is where they determine scores of other people who take the intelligence test. So, for example, your score, if you take this test, will be compared to a sample of scores that were already pre-tested to determine where you fall relative to others. Anytime you hear the term standardized test, that's what it means. So basically, it's not how many questions do you get right or wrong, which is why they always say answer every question. It doesn't matter how many you miss, it's how many you get right. They're looking at how well did you perform, meaning how much did you get correct compared to the pre-tested group. So that's how standardization works. So they re-standardize tests every so often. The Weschler intelligence scores today um, are measured based on a pre-tested group from 2007, I believe. Um, I don't know if it's been re-standardized since then, but in 2007, a group took that test. So today's test takers, their results would not be compared to the original Weschler, which was back in 1930, but to, you know, a test, a group that was tested just 12, 13 years ago. So that is where scores come from on these tests. So every so often, um, tests are periodically re-standardized and they take your performance and compare that to other test takers. So that's the same thing with the ACT. The way that you perform on the ACT, that number that you get, that arbitrary number, is based on how you compare to other test takers, okay? So um, that's where that normal curve comes from. Don't forget that 100 is your average. 68% of people will fall within one standard deviation of that average 185 to a 115, 95% within two. We've talked about that. Um, that's still important to make sure you know. 
Um, which leads me to, into the next topic, which is the Flynn effect. So we have to re-standardize tests as, you know, times change, culture changes, society changes, technology changes. So what the Flynn effect shows, and again, hopefully you're looking at the PowerPoint and you can see that slide where it's showing you over time, intelligence test scores are slowly rising. And that has nothing to do with genetics, okay? The Flynn effect is totally based on environmental factors. Okay, so when we're looking at the improvement of intelligence test scores over time, the reason that's happening is because of things like better education. Okay, kids are going to school longer. Kids are going on to college. Um, there's more technology, better access to education. Nutrition is better. People are having less children, therefore they're spending more time and, you know, more attention and kids are, you know smarter, whatever. So it's all environmental. The Flynn effect, that's important to know, it's all environmental influences. It is not due to genetics. We don't have smarter genes today than we used to. All right, the last two things I need to talk about, which are super, super important, um, is reliability and validity. And you need to make sure that you know the difference in reliability and validity. And if you have any questions, please, 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 please ask. Um, reliability, we wanna make sure tests are reliable. And all that that means is that they give consistent results. Re for a test to be reliable, it just means it is consistent. So if you took the ACT today and you took it again, in two months and your tests were vastly different, let's say you scored a 25 and then a 35, we might say that that test was not reliable because those results were not consistent. Does that, yeah, I'm asking if it makes sense and you're not gonna respond to me. So, so reliability, we can look at reliability in a couple of ways. Like I just said, do the scores correlate? If they correlate, then yes, we would say there is reliability, meaning are they similar, okay? Test and retest, so, you test, you test again, again, comparing the scores shows reliability. Or you can do a split half. So let's say I gave you guys the chapter 11 test and I wanted to see how reliable the results were. I could split evens and odds and compare. Are they, do the scores correlate? Yes, then the test is reliable. Okay, so we're looking at, you know, how do we test for reliability? We can test and then retest. We can do a split half. Either way, if those scores correlate, meaning they are similar and consistent, then we would say a test is reliable, okay? Now, just because a test is reliable does not mean that it has validity. So when we talk about validity, this is the extent to which the test either measures or predicts what it says it will. Now, there are two types of validity, content validity and predictive validity. Content validity is how well does it measure what it's supposed to or that criterion, that pertinent behavior. Okay, how well does it measure your ability to be, I don't know, a lawyer when you take the LSAT or a doctor when you take the MCAT. So like how well does it measure that content, um, that pertinent, criteria, that behavior. Um, a better example actually of content validity, sorry, scratch the doctor lawyer thing, that's in more predictive, um, would be like your driver's test. So think about your driver's test. You, you know, go to wherever, um, probably Lebanon, you get in the car, you drive around and you, you know, go through what you would date, like see on a daily basis, stoplights, stop signs, you know, 25 miles an hour, 30 miles, whatever. Like that test has content validity because it's measuring your ability to do those things you would do on a daily basis. If you living in the suburbs went and took your driver's test in let's say downtown Cincinnati, the content validity wouldn't be as high because it's not really measuring what it, you will be doing on a regular basis in a car, if that makes sense. So content is how well does it sample the behavior of interest, your ability to drive in your you know normal surroundings versus you know driving in a big city, which you wouldn't be doing on a regular basis. So predictive validity 
and that is how well does it predict your future behavior. So this is this is going to be tests like the LSAT and the MCAT. Sorry, I got ahead of myself with content validity. The ACT even. They're looking at how well do these results predict your future um, performance. So how well does that MCAT score really predict how good of a doctor you're going to be? Or how well does the ACT predict how good you're going to do as a freshman in college? So that's, um, that's what predictive validity is. Now, one thing I want you to make sure you understand about predictive validity is that the predictive power of, of test scores, of aptitude tests, it gets um, much lower as your group gets smaller. Um, so what I mean by that, as we have a narrower range of students, for example, um, medical students, kids that are going to go to medical school, you're narrowing the range of people that are taking the MCAT. So if I'm comparing MCAT scores, how much predictive validity do they really have with how good of a doctor you're going to be? Not much, okay? So if you get accepted into a medical school and your MCAT score is a few points lower than someone else's, does that necessarily mean they're gonna be the better doctor? No. So as the group gets smaller, smaller, sorry, and we narrow that um, range of scores, sorry, dogs going crazy. As we narrow that range of scores, um, what happens is the predictive validity starts to decrease. Okay, so um, when we have larger groups, when we're looking at, you know, like your um, intelligence scores of like fourth graders, pretty good predictive um, power in those scores as far as how those kids will perform at the next level, for example. But as that group narrows, as we get a smaller group of people, um, it's not, not as big of a predictor. I hope I didn't confuse you there, um, but please ask questions if you have them. But just to recap, reliability is consistency. How consistent are your scores? Validity is how well does the test measure content validity or predict what it's supposed to. So when we look at an achievement test, we're looking for content validity. We want our achievement test to measure what they're supposed to. So for example, the AP test, how well does it measure your knowledge of psychology? Content validity. Predictive validity, these are your aptitude tests. The ACT, how well does it predict how you're going to perform your first year of college? Okay, I hope that helped and cleared up any confusion. That is all I have for you today. Um, so I will keep that under 20 minutes. I'm proud of myself. Um, once again, I know I tell you this every time, but I miss you guys so much. Um, anytime you want to reach out, please do. Um, I got to join in on a group me with Seventh Bell today, which was super exciting. I love hearing from you guys. I've gotten some emails, um, you know, anything just to keep in touch. Or if you need anything from me, I like I said, I have textbooks um, in my car. I am more than happy to meet you guys somewhere if you don't have a textbook. If you need anything at all, do not hesitate to reach out. Um, I am more than happy, more than happy to help. So good to reach out again. I know I can't actually see you, but I'm pretending you're in front of me right now. Um, but yeah, I know this is tough. I know that um, being inside and not being able to go hang out and do all these fun things is no fun, but hang in there and hopefully we'll be through this soon. It's beautiful outside today, so get outside and practice some social distancing in nature. All right, guys, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.